The Accidental Entrepreneur is brought to you with the help of our sponsor, A. Weber, the world's leading small business email marketing and automation service provider. Since 1998, A. Weber has helped more than 1 million small businesses and entrepreneurs through its suite of web-based email marketing, automation tools, and education. A. Weber, the best option when it comes to marketing your business. The podcast is also brought to you by the Alternative Board. Since 1989, the Alternative Board, or TAB, has been one of the leading peer advisory and business coaching organizations for independent business owners and CEOs across the world. By facilitating peer advisory boards, private one-on-one coaching, and strategic planning services, TAB helps business owners improve their businesses in ways that change their lives. And be sure to check out our affiliate sponsor, One of One Productions, the New Jersey-based podcast studio that produces and edits both audio and video podcasts. They sell equipment for the avid podcaster and have even created a guesting kit exclusively for our listeners. And be sure to support the podcast by ordering some logo merchandise from our online store. Listen to all of our sponsors' commercials later in this episode and follow their links in the show notes to learn more about their products and services. All right. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. If you are listening on your favorite directory and you can leave us a review, make it five stars, please. If you're watching us on YouTube, like us, subscribe, ring the bell, whatever you're going to do. So got another episode coming up. Another great and this is an international show, as, as everybody knows. So we got another great guest. He's up in Ontario, Canada. We're going to talk about his background. He's also a podcast uh, host, which I love having podcast guys on the show. So let's get on with things. Everybody will meet Pete in a minute. The information provided in these episodes is for entertainment purposes only. It is not a guarantee of success or to be construed as advice of any kind. You should always seek advice from local licensed professionals before making any decisions. The dictionary defines an entrepreneur as a person who organizes and manages any enterprise, especially a business, usually with considerable initiative and risk. People often start a business without much choice, perhaps due to a job loss or just being dissatisfied at work, and they come up with an idea they just know can be successful. They become entrepreneurs by accident. That is to say their success or failure happens by accident, not with intention. My name is Mitch Beinhacker. I'm a corporate attorney and a business advisor. You're listening to The Accidental Entrepreneur, my podcast about how to achieve success on purpose, not by accident. Join me along with our monthly guests where we share our knowledge and help you get a hold of your business. And now on to today's episode. All right, Pete. So welcome to the show. I told you we were talking off the mic. I always like guys coming on who, you know, get it and they're helping people to do the things the right way. We can't guarantee their success, right? But increase their chances of success. So you can hear me good, right? I can hear you oh, good. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, great. So why don't you introduce yourself first and let's go into your background and kind of we'll work up to how you got to the journey. Yeah. Well, uh, it's a long one, but uh, my name is Pete Moore. Yeah, yeah, I run a couple of couple of business. I, you know, I, I use the word multipreneur, Mitch. I've always yeah, kind of al- along the road. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, you know, it's <laughs> it's just one of those things that along the way, I've almost always had a couple of businesses on the go. Yeah. Somebody and me portfolio entrepreneur. They're a portfolio entrepreneur. They have a portfolio of businesses. I'm yeah. Not. So it's been one of those things. And, and in order to do that, I've sort of crafted these different methodologies and frameworks and things that allow me to operate uh, different businesses at once. And, you know, so from, from that perspective, that's where I spend most of my time these days is helping other business owners like our listeners here today all around how to free themselves up from the frustration. And I, you know, one of my terms that I'm using these days is moving from operator to owner. Yeah. And there's a difference. Like, there is. And, and it's a yeah. big difference. Right? right. And, and, you know, a lot of us get into business accidentally, right. Yeah, or, right or even on purpose. And, right. but not we, with a lot of planning. We just right. kind of dive in and like, Oh, yeah. we're excited about this. This is great. And I got a garage full of stuff and you're like, what am I doing? You know? Yeah. yeah. And, and so, you know, one year goes by, three years goes by five, 10. Right. And you look back and you're like, man, I got into business because I thought I would have more freedom and I'm still working 50, 60, 70 hours a week. Yeah. I'm still not doing what I maybe want to do. I'm still not working in 
another one of my frameworks called the love it zone. I'm still not working in the actual love it zone of the area yeah. of the business that I truly love to do because I'm mired down in making all these decisions in some of these right. other areas. And you're still putting in the time that you had to put in at the beginning, but you yeah. still, I always say that if you're, what did you say? Going from an operator to, to an owner. owner. If mm -hmm. you're an operator, you're really just an employee of a business that you also happen to own. You're not really the owner. The you know, interesting not, part. Yeah. The, uh, the interesting part of that, Mitch, is that there are so many other stresses when you're yeah. there. So right. not only are you operating the thing, you got to worry about payroll and you got to worry about, you know, cash flow. You got to worry about the next customer. You got to worry about the employee that's unsatisfied. You got to worry about all these other things. Yep. And your family and your relationships and right. your health and all the of the other things. The business and the parent to the family. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you are truly just the operator of your business, why don't you get rid of all those things and go operate somebody else's business? Because then you don't have all that extra. Right. You go home right? at night. It's not your problem. We get into be business because we. You're right. You don't have yeah. to be a firefighter if you don't own the business. Let them no. fight the fires. Yeah, I agree. We, we get into like, business because. Some people maybe should do that, right? Yeah. And yeah. Entrepreneurship's not for everybody. No, not even close. It's probably <laughs> not for a lot of people to do it. <laughs> <laughs> And so, yeah, most, most of my clients, most of the time that I spend is around that, Mitch. It's around this idea that, you know, people get to a certain point in their business and they're like, ah, oh, there's got to be more than this. Right. And, you know, I used to be a business broker. I've been a retailer. I've been a, you know, had bathroom renovation company, all sorts of different businesses along the way. Currently, I'm a retailer. We own some shoe stores as well. And, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's kind of like, hey, listen, as a business, it kind of came, this sort of thought came to me when I was uh, a business broker back several years ago. And it's like, most people want to sell their business because they're fed up with it. Right. Right. And my philosophy is got to yeah. get out, they're done, they can't deal with it, as opposed to preparing for it and yeah. having a successful exit. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, you're a lawyer, I'm sure you work with a lot of transitions and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and so as a business broker or as a lawyer or a, or a business coach, it's kind of like, you actually, in order to sell your business, your business is going to be a whole lot more valuable if you're the owner of it, not the operator of it. Yeah. To the buyer, it's going to be more mm -hmm. valuable to the buyer. They see how you've equipped things, you run things, you can transition. Yeah. No question about it. More and, valuable to you too. Like you can, yeah. you're going to be able to get a higher ticket and a higher multiple for that if it's running by itself. Right. But, and you can't do that 30 days before you decide, Take you know what? Time. I'm done with this because you're just worn out. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, so I, I started thinking about all this sort of stuff. And when I'm working with a lot of clients that are feeling like they may be ready to sell their business and I talk to them about, hey, we need to set up the process, the people, all of the things in place so that you can right. earn the right amount of profit. And then you're, you're in multiples of the profit. and The people that are going to buy the business come in when they start doing this and setting their business up to sale. Yeah. Then. You know, we're, we're setting all this stuff in place and often they don't actually want to sell it at the end of that because they, they start to begin to say, Hey, this can run on itself. I don't need this. I don't need all the stress. I don't need all this stuff. And, and now I'm working in the area of the business that I truly love. So why don't I have it as more of an, in, think of it as more of an investment as opposed to a job. Yeah. And I can keep it. Right. Well, they're selling for the wrong reasons. They're selling for, they realize that or they feel that they just can't deal with this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to change their perspective, but that's why you take the time as an entrepreneur to work with professionals, to find out what other people to learn a little bit and to do things. Look, it's the reason I started the podcast. And it's also one of the, one of the frustrations I have as a business attorney is yeah, I'm, I'm rescuing people all the time. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, the world's falling apart. People no, do no. come to me and they're, they're For good, sure. you know, doing the right things, but there are plenty of people that come to me and say, they got to negotiate out of their lease and close mm -hmm. their doors. And like, why, you know, and they got no business plan or they, they didn't keep with whatever. And it's, it's frustrating. It really is because people can be more successful and they can have better qualities of life and do those kind of things. But I'm sure if we go back, right, you, you started like everyone else, right? So you were just like, you didn't know. And you started. So what, what was like in the early days, what was one of the first businesses that you got started with? Well, I mean, I, I'm one of those sort of, people that came up in an entrepreneurial family. So I cut lawns and I made crafts and did all that kind of stuff and had little landscaping businesses through school. My first real one after I finished um, school, you know, university was a uh, company called Surface Doctor. 
and it okay. was a franchise. And we went in and refinished bathtubs and refinished kitchens and like all sorts of type of a thing. Same right? sort of thing. Yeah. So, um, and that was in 1994 and, uh, you know, almost 30 years ago. And, um, I, I learned all about franchising. I learned all about why I didn't want to be a franchise in that franchise. Right. Uh, and yeah. we ended up defranchising that business about five years in after all kinds of franchise or problems. Uh, and, uh, you know, long story short is we sold that business in 2009 and it's still going strong today. The person that bought it from me is doing really well with it. It's almost 30 years old. And, right. you know, um, they carried on the same sort of process we had in place and, and have, have continued to do well. At the same time, I had another uh, cleaning franchise um, for about 10 years when I had that business as well. And we grew yeah. that business from when I took it over 30 customers to about 300 when we sold it. And um, then I became a business broker, worked with some other people, helping them buy and sell businesses. Uh, was and a then, lot of franchises that you bought and sold? Uh, no, uh, those like as a business broker, you mean? Yeah. No, it was more independent business. Independent uh, business. Yeah, there were some franchises involved, but yeah, it was more yeah. independent business um, and, you know, bigger ticket uh, than the sort of the lower entry type stuff. Yeah. And, you know, it's a little bit off the topic, but I think your comment about franchising. Look, franchising could be a good way to go for somebody who needs sure. a business in a box and so forth. But you, yeah. you do have to be cautious because you're not just buying the business, mm -hmm. but you're getting in bed with the franchisor. And you've got to make sure that they're a supportive organization, that there's a reason you're giving them money, that the mm -hmm. other people in the system are supportive. So I know some people that have been very successful with their franchise. Oh, They'll tell you that they have so much support from other operators and from the franchisor that it really makes their business easy. And then there's other ones that they don't even know who their franchisor is. It's just, and those things are just, you give them money away. So you got to be careful when you get in bed with those things. You know, and, and I'll go back to that first one that I bought. The reason I bought that one is because it's what I could afford as a 23 year old kid. There you go. Right. Yeah. Like that's, that's the amount of money I had. And I'm like, I think I can do this. And, and, and so I, I, I did it and went into it and, you know, there's a whole, we could talk a couple of other podcasts on how all of the different things that happened there went, but, right. you know, uh, but at the same time, one of my uh, old next door neighbors uh, owned six McDonald's stores, which is an awesome franchise. And they did phenomenally well for 20 some years and uh, as owners and sold out and did great. So there are, true successful uh, franchise stories. And I love those as well. I'm not dissing it by any means, but there's a big difference between certain ones. Right, exactly. Yeah. 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 And these people will sell anything and can get people to buy into anything. For sure. Yeah. You know, so, okay. So then you went on to, where were we? You were a business broker. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I ended up pitching. Were industries that you were selling or was it kind of all anything. over the yeah, all over the place. So I worked for a company at the time called Sunbelt Business Brokers, which is one okay. of the large business brokers. And, you know, they, they were franchised too. And I worked for the franchisee that owned all of Canada in the auto office. And, uh, you know, we, we, you know, helped business owners and it was uh, interesting stuff. Like it was manufacturing businesses, it was service businesses, it was retail businesses. And as you can imagine, anybody who owns a business at some day, needs to sell that business or close it, yeah. however it's going to happen. So right. we dealt and we worked through the finances and found uh, appropriate buyers and all kinds of stuff. It was really interesting. And uh, from that perspective, um, that's how I found the current business that we still own. The shoe um, store chain? Yeah. So ah, we had, okay. it was at the time it was one store, uh, it was called Shootopia and I pitched it to uh, a client and he basically said, there's no way in heck you can get me moved. It, there's no way in heck you can get me and my family to move four hours or five hours away to some small town in southwestern Ontario. And it was uh, he's like, I'm from yeah. Ottawa. It's like, yeah, right. no problem. So, uh, but as business brokers, you really got to dig down and, and get into the the whole business and understand it yeah. and go into the numbers and, you know, right. really truly understand it so that you can actually show it properly. Right. right. So yeah. I had really looked into this business and I'm, I'm saying, you know, I think this is a good business. I talked to my wife, we are small town people and we went and, and actually acquired that business. And we found that other gentleman, another business that it was more apropos for what he was looking for, but uh, it's, you know, business brokerage. Four or five hours away. Did we did. Family? Yeah. Yeah, God. we did. Yeah. Okay. So we, we made the move in 2010. We've owned that business since then. We've added another shoe store. We added a third shoe store. We've since closed 
that shoe store. I did use a lawyer to help me um, move out yeah. of the lease uh, nice. that we had there. Like yeah. years, you know, we didn't talk about this before you came on, but you know, my lawyer helped me through a, a bad lease that we had had. And, uh, and that came out, you know, uh, as successful as we could make it come out for all parties involved. And, you know, so have I lived and learned some of that stuff along the way? You're, you bet. And, yeah. you know, when I'm talking to my clients, when with all the different uh, industries that I, that I coach to, it's, it's really interesting because we'll use some of those experiences. And it's like, Hey, listen, you should look at this and you should look at this and all the different experiences along the way. Cause there's been yeah. a lot, you know? Yeah. So you don't do as much brokerage now. I don't do any anymore. Oh, you yeah. don't do any? Yeah, okay. I'm not licensed anymore. Okay. Podcasting, mm -hmm. the business. Yeah. So yeah. I, right now, it's uh, we have uh, the shoe stores, and then I spend how most many, of how my many locations. You have the shoe just stores two. Right yeah, just two. Okay. Two locations, and then I spend most of my time with Simplifying Entrepreneurship, which is my coaching business, and I go speaking, you know, for a variety of different associations. And I was literally on a, on a call this morning with a group of people in one of this uh, buying group association that I coach groups of people, or I coach one on one as well. And and so that's where I spend most of my time these days. And with the shoe store, you have a manager and and a, and yep. a person, a buyer. You're not going to Italy and buying choose right no uh but but i mean yes we we can do that sort of stuff and that's part of uh you know from depending on on what areas you want to do but i coach based on the fact that you don't have to make you know here's one of my other lines that i use a lot mitch which is um decisions should be made at the lowest possible level of your organization right and okay. if if that's the case um, I shouldn't be involved in, and I, and I'm not involved in making all of the buying choices for our stores anymore. Right. 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 So I have a buyer and yeah. he's accountable. And so, I mean, from a owner perspective, I'm involved and it's like, Hey, we talk about some strategies around that stuff and everything. But when it comes down to placing those orders in Italy or in the States or in Canada, wherever they are, it doesn't really matter. Um, he's the one who's accountable. And, uh, so I work in my shoe stores now uh, about a day a week on average, and the rest of the time we have set up an, a great accountability chart. I have awesome people in place that really help me and and make the goals happen that we have set out as a buying group or as a management team um, to happen for Shootopia, right? And that's, I mean, I, it's hard for me to coach that stuff if I'm not actually living it, right? No, I, I agree with you. And even if it's a small business, look, Jeff Bezos definitely isn't buying product to fill a warehouse, no. figure out what kind of, and that would be ridiculous. It would be a terrible use of his time. And I think people don't value the time that they have and the use of what they're doing. If, if you're trying to build a business, you got to pretend like you're the, you're at the top of the pyramid and people are going to rely on you and you're going to empower, power people. Men look, that's why there's leadership coaching and leadership's a difficult thing too. you know, being a Gosh, leader yeah. and empowering people and not just ordering them around. And that's a problem. You know, it's, it's something that people need to, it's a learned skill, right? But some people struggle with it. They just have trouble communicating. They, they order people around. Nobody likes to be told what to do. People yeah. like to be empowered. So they'll do it on their own and, and, you know, and feel good about what they're doing, but they certainly don't. That's the way we're doing it. And Pete, I don't want to hear about it. You do it that way. And you're like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever, you know, yeah. so yeah. But, you know, part of being a leader is um, sharing the why all the time, right? It's, yeah. it's like, I've got this uh, other little philosophy around what I call the three leadership things you need to work on this year. You got to become a CPA and that's not a chartered professional accountant. That's a master in communication, process and accountability. Very good. And from those things, I mean, your job as a leader is to communicate the why. Why are we doing this every day yeah. to all yeah. of the people in your team? They need to know with ultimate clarity that any decision that they make revolves around why we do this in our organization. And that's what I call the promise of your organization. And then the account, the accountability part or the process part is aligning all those processes because most people will say, well, I can't, I don't trust that person enough to make this happen. Right. So I haven't assigned accountability, which is your biggest issue to free yourself up is that you got to start assigning accountability, right? Well, I don't trust them to do it. Yeah, they're, they're not the well, right people. The reality of it is, is if you don't trust the person, why is that person in your business? Right. It's usually they don't trust the process. Yeah, yeah and you they gotta let people, you know, fly out of the nest a little bit. Make sure you know, 
like trust that people can figure it out. If you have good people working for you, give them an opportunity to fly, you know? Yeah. Or like and, get rid of them. I mean, that's yeah. unfortunate. And, and so we often as leaders say, oh, I just don't trust that person. But, you know, and I encourage anybody listening here is, is it the person you don't trust or is it the process you don't trust? Right. And you usually really don't trust the person, then don't keep them. But if it's really right. just the process and you do like them and you do believe in them and you know they buy into your vision, hopefully, mm. then, yeah, you're 100% right. Yeah, Absolutely. you got to tweak process in order so that it's at a point where you can then assign them, align it and assign it to them and have trust in the process and have trust in them to be held accountable to make this happen. Okay, so we're going to get into for lack of a better term, simplify how to simplify entrepreneurship and make things simple maybe after the break. But we got another, you know, little while. But I you obviously don't just wake up one day and say, I'm gonna coach people. Something must have happened where somebody said, Hey Pete, I see you're successful. Would you talk to me about so you can tell me about that process, how that came about into For the sure. coaching world? For sure. Yeah. Um, do you want to go with that now or yeah, after the break? About it now. Yeah. No, cool. No, do the break later. Cool. Um, so basically I have been essentially coaching people all my life. Um, you know, it's just part of my nature. My mom's a teacher and, uh, you know, I, I kind of grew up in that sort of, uh, right. area so where it's like a long time. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and happily, <laughs> by the way, happily, you know, I want people to succeed. I have a general, you know, um, mantra of, I want to share my experiences so that others don't go through the bad stuff. And so that others can take advantage of the good stuff. Right. Definitely and, you know, and they can do what they want with it and set up their own action steps. But, you know, my philosophy is that um, I've got a sort of an overarching idea here, Mitch, that entrepreneurs, business owners are the true backbones of their society. You know, they're the ones, right. they're the little yeah. league coaches, commerce, right? Yeah. They're, and, and they're yeah. the ones that give back. They're, like I said, they're the yeah. little league coaches. They're the ones that um, are usually in charge of, of fundraising for the local hospital or the church steeple or the new playground down the road. You know, it's interesting when you start digging into the foundations of these things on how, how much entrepreneurs and business owners are involved as being the leaders in their communities. So my philosophy is that. Makes sense. Yeah. If I can set, help them set up to have either more time or more money through the frameworks that I provide with simplifying entrepreneurship so that they will give back more time and more money to their particular community. And when in doing that, it's, it's sort of like, this is my big sort of philosophy is that somehow in way I've helped that little community because I helped that entrepreneur either get back more time and get back more money or give them more money so that they can then turn it back. Cause they do. Most yeah. of the plaques that you see for anything that's been built, those are entrepreneurs that have given them. Most of them, yep. Absolutely. I'm not saying all, but most of them are. And right. if you look at almost all the charitable foundations, almost all of the things where people are volunteering their time, a lot of those are entrepreneurs. Of course, especially nowadays. Yeah. Absolutely. So I want to give I want to give more freedom to the entrepreneurs so that they can they can have more time and do what they truly love or to give back to their communities, whatever the case is and as well as help them make more money. So that's sort of the overarching reason why I, why I've kind of made a business out of this, as opposed to just, right. um, you know, doing it for my buds and all that kind of stuff along the way. Of course. So yeah. how, so tell me about the development. You obviously you're helping people. You're, and yeah. then at some point you start developing processes, you start seeing trends. What did, how'd yeah. you build that? Yeah. Cause it's a business, right? Yeah. How did it you is. start building that, yeah. that business? Well, um, you know, three or so years ago, um, you could find me on the internet, let's say. If you typed in, you'd see some Shootopia stuff and you'd see some other stuff that I've done in the past. But, right. you know, I have this, um, in order to be a business coach and have a certain amount of authority, um, that's why I started podcasting, Mitch, you know, so that I could right. build some authority, right? Yeah, and so, right. you know, I, I had a, a mission to get out and do 30 podcast guestings within a three month period. I wanted to be on 10 podcasts a, um, a month. And I ended okay. up being on 60 over three months because I just okay. made it a priority. I've yeah. been on, um, you know, this was a couple of years ago, but I've been on um, probably over 150 podcasts as a guest now and yeah. have released 
you know, give or take a hundred or so episodes of uh, the business owner breakthrough, uh, which is my podcast. And, okay. um, you know, from that perspective, it's built authority. So you can easily find me on the internet now. And, right. you know, so that's, that's one of the things working and it's been hard because I really launched this business just before COVID and I wanted to do more stage uh, presentations and public right. speaking and a lot of that sort of stuff. So yeah. I did that virtually and I still right. work with all sorts of mastermind groups and different groups virtually, but I'm starting to get on stages a little bit more now too, which is fun. I've got a bunch of different stuff lined up for this year. And uh, so that's one of the pieces of the puzzle. I've uh, written over probably a hundred different articles in the last few years. So I'm, I'm actually, I'm actively um, getting myself out there as being uh, an authority in small business, which I mean, I, like we said from the beginning, I've been at it for almost 30 years now and have been through a lot of different things. And one of the things that's always bothered me about any profession is that um, people that sort of hang their shingle and don't actually, uh, do what they are teaching or don't have any experience in what they're sort of coaching. Right. So I mean, that's always a problem, right? It's, and it's a big problem. And it, coach, but you need some back, you know, get some background. You it's have a big problem in this industry, Mitch, you know, there's right. a lot of, there's a lot of business coaches out there that have never really owned their, any business other than their business coaching business. Right. And so, you know, it's, it's just like, well, you know, you can teach a framework then, but it's hard to kind of come up with, all of the analogies and stories and right. personal experiences. experiences. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, I think that's kind of um, where things came into play. And because of my passion for sort of sharing all of this stuff and wanting others to do well, um, I talked a little bit about another framework I have called your love it zone. And this is my love it zone, Mitch. Man, I love talking to people like you. I love talking to business yeah, owners. I love yeah. digging through their problems and saying, Hey, what if we looked at this this way? Or what if we, you know, let's, let's, let's dig into this and see what we can do to solve this problem. And to me, that's engaging, energizing, exciting. Yeah. Well, did so, you find that? people or make things more complicated than they need to be. Is that why your approach is like, Hey, let's make it not as overwhelming yeah. and simplified. Is that yeah, the finding that to be the case? The business is called simplifying entrepreneurship because yeah, yeah, really yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, it often is easier than it appears. Right. And right. it's so interesting, it's right? So let's just, let's just take this, whatever you're dealing with and sort of come out of the uh, immediacy of it and look at it from a, a, you know, a higher level and look down at it and, and pick this thing apart so that we can set up the right process, assign the right people. Uh, and, and sometimes that's involved involving getting outsourced partners to come in and help out, or maybe, maybe it's somebody within the team that's going to take on a different accountability, whatever the case is, but let's set this thing up so that you don't feel so frustrated. And I, you know, another, I have all these little, sayings, but I, I say, let's move you from being frustrated to being free, right? Turning your frustrations into freedom is a big piece of what I'm trying to do. And anytime I'm thinking about these different things, when we, when we talk about this and explore this in any of the meetings that I'm on, whether they're group or one-on-one, -on -one, it's really like, Hmm, how can we, how can we get rid of this frustration, set up the right process so that this happens auto magically in the future and you don't have to worry about another Pedism. Yeah, there you go. Well, that you one's know, actually that that one's actually from uh, my friend Ari Mizell, who's a real process master. He's he's pretty good. Give him credit. You probably write yeah. a dictionary at some point. The Entrepreneur's Dictionary. You can have yeah. all these different terms from you and colleagues and things like that. All right. Well, why don't we take like a two minute break? I got to you know the sponsors pay me a little bit of money, so I got to nice. give them some credit, and then maybe we can get into advice. You know. How do you simplify your business? What are things mm -hmm. I know you have a process. We don't want to give away the store, but yeah, you know, give good. some people some usable things they can take away from our discussion that they maybe can go out and start having a little bit different perspective on what it is they do on a daily basis. Does that makes sense. Awesome. Yes, sir. All right. Let's go to the commercials then. Here's a word from our sponsors. Looking to market and grow your business, or perhaps you're just getting started and want to hit the ground running. AWeber is the best choice for online email marketing and automation of your business. From maintaining a subscriber list to drip campaigns and landing pages, AWeber gives you tools and integrations that make marketing easy and fun. As our partner and sponsor, we use all their tools to promote the podcast and market our law firm. AWeber, 
the best alternative for online marketing. For over 30 years, the Alternative Board, or TAB, has built a thriving community of forward-thinking CEOs and business owners who want to radically improve their companies. Through unique combinations of one-on-one -on -one business coaching, participation in monthly TAB board meetings with other non-competing owners, a suite of strategic tools and customized strategic planning workshops, TAB membership can deliver greater strength to your business and a better work-life balance for you and your family. All packaged in a streamlined and affordable service that the people at TAB invite you to try risk-free. Maybe you're looking to get into podcasting or you just want to market your business. Maybe you want to do it for enjoyment or because you have a message you want to get out there. One of One Productions is a New Jersey-based studio just over the George Washington Bridge that caters to the booming business of podcasting. They offer a comfortable atmosphere using the latest technology available to record your podcast. And they are a full-service media company offering both audio and video production services, creating both audio and video podcasts, as well as video shorts for business and personal use. Professional audio equipment packages are available through their website for all budgets. And be sure to check out their podcast guesting kit created especially for our listeners. Follow the link in the show notes to learn more about all of our sponsors. And now back to our show. All right, we're back. You could hear that, right? You could hear that? Yes, okay. sir. Um, yeah, so let's get into, you know, some advice for people. You've been doing this now several years. Mm -hmm. You've been in business for much longer than that. Yeah. What is simplifying entrepreneurship and how do we simplify it? Well, I think the biggest thing, Mitch, that I see out there is that people don't actually give themselves time to think about their business. Right. Because they're fired, they're firemen. Yeah, they're fired people. They come in and they just put out fires all day, and they and every day the exhausted. Right, right. Yeah. So you know, going going back to the love it or leave it framework, I think is interesting because, like you said, with, with you finish the day exhausted. So here's here's something that I encourage everybody to listen to, or everybody who's listening here to think about. Okay, are you coming home at the end of the day feeling that way? feeling exhausted, you know, at the end of the day, when you walk through the door at home, or if you work at home, when you kind of close the office, are you feeling mentally and physically drained? Are you feeling as though oh, that was like a hard, long day? Yeah. And if you are, you've got work to do because one of the other things I mentioned was I love having these conversations, right? So I'm working in my love it zone every day. And I want that for everybody that I work for too, because at the end of a 10 or 12 hour day, if you feel as though, man, that was an awesome day and I love what I do. It's such a different feeling than coming home at the end of a 10 or 12 hour day and going, whew, I don't know whether I'm going to be able to, like, I think I'm going to bed. Right. Break right? out the burp, you know? Mm, yeah. I love bourbon, but not for the wrong reasons. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I'm with you. <laughs> so uh, I'm a whiskey drinker uh, hey, here, like Canadian whiskey, you know, no, rye oh, whiskey. Yeah. But I like yeah. bourbon too. No, um, rye, I'm into rye too. Yeah. So but you're uh, right. you get home and it, you know, it's like, a, you know, it's like a commercial. Feeling down from work? Try our new bourbon. You know, that's, <laughs> that's what it is. But yeah, people look. I feel the same way sometimes too. I am. Yeah big organizer, you know, I got lists, I program things on my mm -hmm. schedule because if I don't do it, mm -hmm. it, your whole day gets taken away from you within an hour or half an hour being in the office or wherever your business is, you know? If you don't structure your time, somebody else will for you. Yeah, right. Exactly. They'll make the rules and they, they want you. It's funny, my father, he passed away in December and he, you know, it's hard because I get a lot of advice from him. I've always gotten a lot of guidance from him over the years. He's been a salesman since 1965 in the insurance business. So he grew up in a world that was a little, a little bit different than it is now. And he always used to tell me that on like Mondays, for example, he wouldn't come into the office too early because he knew that whatever happened over the weekend, his staff would probably solve most of the problems by, you know, one, two o'clock in the afternoon. So he'd make a lunch meeting, go to lunch and get in the office. And it was most of it. And it was true. 90% of it was dealt with and sometimes that's a good thing like throw your staff into the fire let them deal with it and see how it goes you don't when have we, to do everything yourself yeah 
So like, like we said earlier, decisions should be made at the lowest possible level of the organization. Like your dad yeah. didn't need to be involved in those. Decisions. Right. He's like, why am I dealing with this? Right. right. Yeah. And he found his own little process to solve that. Yeah. And I'll give everybody here listening one other process to solve that, that I often will, will talk about if somebody's coming to you and here's another sort of line that comes up. If you ask yourself this question, why don't they just make this decision? They should already know how to do that. Right. Like if you ask, like if you're asking yourself that question, when one of your team is, is talking to you, yeah. then here's what you say back to them. If I wasn't here, what would you do? Yeah, because it's a problem if you're thinking that. And, and if so if I don't know, then maybe that tells you something, right? Right. And so um, and here's where uncomfortable silence comes into play. Right. So it's like, <laughs> OK, so if I wasn't here, like if I was in Italy or if I was, uh, you know, on the uh, moon, you're yeah, totally whatever, un unavailable. What right? would you do? Yeah. And and sit in uncomfortable silence until they respond. Yeah. Yeah, I know and, people are very afraid of that. They really have trouble keeping it. I know, it's like I know. The, the biggest like, thing. But yeah, you're at a fishing camp in up, upstate Canada, yeah. in Ontario, and there's yeah. no cell service, and they can't get a hold of you. What are they going to do? They can just shut the doors and go home for yeah. the day? No. Yeah. Figure right. it out. Right. And it usually has to do with the fact that you've properly communicated the why of the business, the promise, like I talked about, in setting up the guiding principles of your business and all of that yeah. kind of stuff. But if they go back up that sort of level to that level and they say, okay, well, we always do it this way because this is our why, then the decision should be made without you. And it becomes a coaching moment as the yeah. leader of that business and, or, or as the leader of that person, if, if they're your direct charge, then it becomes a coaching moment. And you're like, you know what? That's exactly how I would have dealt with it. Um, Congratulations and Good job. Better, you know move move on and, and deal with it that way. That that sounds great, you know. Yeah. Or if there's opportunity there and you're you're saying, okay, well, um, we do need to tweak this uh, example, and that's where you fix the process. Remember, you got to trust the person and trust the process, right? Just so learn if that. if we need to tr tweak the process, we tweak the process so that any time this comes up in the future, it's done. And that's the way you're removing some of these frustrations and, and answering. So you, the listener, next time somebody here that comes to mind and you're like, oh gosh, man, why don't they just make, like, they should know how to make this decision. Right. That's the question that you ask them. You, you answer the question answer. with a question. Yeah. What would you do if I wasn't here? Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I find, or maybe a better way to say it is, do you find that, a lot of business owners, as they start to give away things, they have like one person who's maybe been with them for a long time and they yeah. start offloading because you said you give it to the lowest person, the lowest, you know, lowest common denominator, lowest on the total. Ball. But they they have this person that's been with them from the beginning and they yeah. start making them into themselves. So they start unloading everything on this one person becomes so reliant on this person. They're probably not even doing their job effectively because they have so many hats yeah. and they get to the point where if this person leaves, they are totally screwed. So I think I had a. It was a colleague of mine or something where they literally told this one person who was like handling all this stuff saying, listen, we're going to pay you, but you're going to take like a month off or was it two or three weeks. And mm -hmm. we're going to see if we can handle everything without you. And they discovered some holes and some things they didn't know, but they started realizing that this person doesn't need to be the jack of all trades. They can be the president or they can be the admin, the office administrator, and they don't have to do it. And it kind of solved the bottom. Like, do you find that that's a common problem that business owners face if they're if they're starting to offload things but they don't do it properly for sure and and that's you know i've got uh, a structure called the five p's and the five p's yeah. we've talked a little bit about a couple of them already but just to give you uh, an outline of the, the five P's, yeah yeah so the five <laughs> p's essentially are these um your promise you got to have yep. your promise down pat right okay and then you have to align your products your process and your people to that promise so okay. that you can have the right amount of profit, which is the end result of what we're looking for in business, unless you're not for profit, right? But Very profit good. can be looked at in different ways. If you want, like it, it could be looked at, you want more time or you want more, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't always have to align with dollars, but no. you know, the, with, with those kind of things, the guiding principle is what is your promise? What's the promise you're making to your clients? 
right. so that everything underneath it aligns. And through COVID and through all these different things that we've had over the last, you know, as, as the world is changing here crazy over the last few years, sometimes people that have been at it, especially for a while now, they've had a promise for a long time, but that promise doesn't necessarily align to how their particular clients want things to align to anymore. Right. Do you they've think done- that, uh, that's just a lack of paying attention to? Yeah, think- it's, it's yes, to a certain degree, but it's also like people get habitualized into how they deliver their products and Places. services right. and it's they don't do the same way all the yeah, time. Right. And because they're, we, you know, because they're in the fires of putting out all of the stuff every day, they don't take that step to go back and kind of look at things as an overarching sort of, is this the way forth and think about the future of what's going on. And a lot of business owners just don't give themselves time, like specific time to do that. Right. Like asking the big questions, you know, why do my clients buy the service or product mm. when they do? And, and, and uh, the good ones that I work with do it all the time. Yeah. They don't do it and start their business and they keep doing it because it changes. And nine times out of 10, what they thought was the reason that the people motivates the customer is not the reason. Just because you think it's a great idea and that I would do this does not mean that everybody who walks through your door is going to feel the same way. Most of them probably do not. And that's I think that's a big shortcoming. And the ones that are successful that I know. They, they do They you know, you don't, they don't ask five, they don't ask 10, they ask 50, they ask a hundred. They're always asking their customers, mm-hmm. how can we improve this? Why did you buy this? What, what would be an additional service you would buy and why? And then you can make better, you know, from the top, right? Better yeah. strategic decisions when it comes to how you grow your business and the services you add and the, your, your, your product offering or, you know, whatever it happens to be. And that, I agree with you. That's how it, it has to be aligned for you to be successful. Cause you're not going to get from the first P to the fifth P if it's not, you know, if it's not flowing through all the people and I mean, that's basically a business plan, right? If you took all those P's and you made it into five parts, you would basically have a, a strategic plan that you could work and follow through, right? Which is probably what you do with your, with your clients, I would guess, right? It's a big piece. I mean, taking that and overlaying that framework onto, uh, onto whatever existing business or a new business is a big piece for sure. And there, I mean, we've got a thousand other frameworks that we can um, of course. use, but, but that's a guiding principle one. And, um, because you want those people in your organization to be making the right decisions around your products, around your services, around your process and around your people. And I like to really think of people in three different ways. And those three ways essentially are these. The first way is that you have um, the, your ideal client. Right. Number, number two is that you have your ideal team members. And number okay. three is that you have your ideal outsource suppliers, like anybody else who's involved in right. making your promise happen. Right. Yeah. You know, no, I love the ideal. And there's okay. usually, yeah, there's usually work to do on each of those. Sometimes we need right. to tweak who our ideal client is as, as business. And that's a choice, on, right? right? You, I, your ideal client is who you want to do business with, not who has to, you have to do business with. Absolutely. But I think about it. Do you feel that way? Sorry, Mitch, you're breaking up a little bit there. Oh, do you hear me now? Yeah, I do. Yeah, the the, the video will correct us later yeah. on. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah, what I was saying was I find that people, um, they think that there's people they have to do business with as opposed mm-hmm. to the ideal profile of who I want to do business with. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And sometimes, especially on startup, we feel that we have to take the next dollar and sometimes we do like we got to make payroll we got to make our rent right. and stuff like that but as you hone these processes and as you get more clear on your promise and you get more clear on the different things that you want to do then it can really become an idea around your picking your client and it, it's you picking the client as opposed to the client picking you and that's right. when that's when business gets fun because you're really starting to zone in on your Pitch ideal down. client and you yeah. know what you can do to help them through their issues right. and, uh, and they're willing to pay for that. Yeah. I think people don't realize that refining that process and honing that down and niching down with what you offer actually increases your, so it increases your quality of life, right? You're happier with what you do. You're doing business with people you like and you understand and you relate to, but it also in the long run, in most cases increases your profit, it doesn't reduce your profit because you're like pushing all these people off of the table. That's not what's happening. It's it's actually that you're becoming a specialist. You're focusing and you're putting your energies in the right place and you're spending your money the right way and you have the right people and they all buy into your vision and your profits go up. 
And people miss that all the time. And that's consistent. Did you lose me? You can't hear me? I'm I'm having a real hard time hearing you, Mitch. Okay, I can hear you. It must be your connection on your end. I've got can I've got a now? full I got all my bars. Uh Yeah, on, I'm on a hard on connection. That's how I know I don't have a bar problem. But so it must be a, maybe uh Comcast just cut your line outside or something. We had that last week. Hmm. So can you hear me now? I got you now. Okay. Yeah, it must be a it must be an internet thing. It's just and and uh yeah, your your um it says recording continued smoothly. Live video will return when their internet improves, and that's what it's saying on your side. Yeah, no, I I'm on a hard connection. It's weird. Yeah, me too. What, uh, yeah, so, are you are you on a hard connection plugin? Yeah, Did man, you come back I've now? Lost you again? Huh? I could see you this whole time. I could see you. I can hear you. No problems on my end. Okay. Yeah. Weird. Um. I. Uh, but let's talk how, about the, how, do you, how, how do you want to take this, Mitch? I mean, I, you're really just coming in and out all the time. Yeah. Well, I can, you can't hear me. Can you hear me now, Pete? Let me double check. Are you over here? I got you now. I think you got me now. Yeah, I can hear you the whole time. I haven't no. lost your video. I haven't lost your internet. I, I got you're clear on my end. That's that's weird. So you can't hear me right now. I you I just got you. Uh, can you hear me right now? Yeah, but it's breaking up. Yeah, huh. I got you right now. Okay, so now I'm back. Or no? I think you have no, an I lost you again. Side. Yeah. Hold mm -hmm. on a second. Let's. See. And I I don't know. Like I said, I've got uh, just on my side. Um, it literally says Mitch, uh, enabled low data mode. Everyone's still recording in high quality, but, um, it's saying on, on my little panel beside your picture, cause I use Riverside too. I get it. Right. Um, but it's saying that it's, it's, uh, your internet is, uh, is causing issues here. Yeah. That's weird. I don't see any, I don't have any messages on my side. Can you see me now? Uh, now I've got your video back now all of a sudden. Okay. I clicked around a couple of things. Yeah. Has my video been clear the whole time? No, uh, he can't hear me. If I turn this to low data mode, now you can't see me? Now I can't see you, no. But you can hear me. A, a little better than before. Yeah, that's weird. I have had no problems on my end. I've heard you all, yeah. the whole time. I hear you talking to me. I hear you and you can't hear me. Well, I, I can actually hear you right now, so we can carry okay. on. If, but we can try and go back to video in a minute. But, um, yeah, I was saying before yeah. about when, you know, people don't realize when they niche down, when they focus yeah. on their ideal client, that they uh, – I believe your video, by the way, will still come back when we release yeah, this. that's the beauty of, the, of Riverside, exactly. right? Riverside, yeah. Right. Um, you know, that they actually increase their profits, right, as a result of – niching down and being specific yeah. about who you do business with and, and improves their life, like which is your goal, to make their life better and have them enjoy what it is that they're that they're doing. I mean, you know, that's why we get into business, right? We get yeah. into business because we have the dreams of a better life. And, you know, you may no. have been come into business accidentally. You may have been forced into business or you may have chosen to go the business route along the way. But whatever reason, Think back to when you started your business and think back to the reasons why you said, you know what, maybe being a business owner is for me. And think back to all of those things that you dreamed about as to why it was for you and why you made the decision to become a business owner. Typically, it's around the freedoms. And those freedoms are, yeah. I want I want my time. I want to be able to make my own choices. I want to uh, have the ability to, it doesn't matter because the freedoms are uniquely yours. I mean, maybe you would like to travel. Maybe you want to work remotely. Maybe like all of these different things. Maybe I want to employ my family. Maybe I don't want to employ my family. I mean, all of these different things are uniquely yours. But if you think, if you think back to that and the reason you got into business in the first place, and if you aren't living those freedoms yet, then that's where we need to set the business up in order to provide you with more of those freedoms. And that, like you said earlier on, it may not come quickly. It may take some time and that's fine. But if you're right. doing it with the purpose of 
I want to take a two week vacation or I want to take a month off. And I mean, I just enjoyed a month off in Florida um, for the month of March. And that was by purpose. I mean, we set that up and I couldn't have done that if I didn't have the right process in place, the right people in place, the right profit in order to do that, all of these different things. But it's on purpose that I did that because that's one of the freedoms that I wanted from my business. Right. Now, is part of your process you help people kind of create their strategic plan or their business plan, even if it's a one page type of yeah, a yeah, yeah. type of so, a thing. Yeah. yeah. We use, I almost always start with sort of what's the goal here mm -hmm. for your life, because when you're a business owner, you know, being a business owner in your life is sort of yin and yang. And we right. want to make sure that, um, you know, there's the, the whole framework around, you know, um, whether you're, uh, whether you're giving yourself enough time and everything. And I, I'm a believer really on the idea that there are seasons of business where you just have to put up and shut up and get it done. And, right. and there are seasons where, and uh, we're in tax time for a lot of accounts right now. Yeah. So it's like, they have to get it done now. Like take yep. some time off in September. Don't take it off now. You know? Right. So, I mean, you have to understand the ebbs and flows and where I find a lot of business owners live is that there are no ebbs and flows. It's just like full on all the time, all, all the, time. the time. Right. Right. And yeah, that's a problem. Not. And that you got to set that up yourself. Right. I mean, yeah. you got to control your schedule a little bit. So we kind of rewind to the big picture as to what you want out of your life, what you want out of your health, your wealth, your relationships, all of those different things. And then we come back in and start saying, okay, let's build the process of your business using your business to actually start delivering this to you based on your priority of what you need. And, you know, one of the ones that I have on the top end of my thing is that um, I want to remain and be healthy healthy mentally, healthy physically. And I'm not, you know, I don't have the six pack abs and I'm not like super, no. like a super built dude or anything like that. But the idea here is that I want to remain healthy mentally and physically because if I'm not healthy, I can't run a healthy business. Right. Yeah, right. You can't take care of your family if you're not healthy. You can't take care of your business if you're not healthy. I'm not making healthy decisions. I'm not make. I can't be physically healthy in my businesses. I mean, like, if your health, if you're suffering from anxiety and you're suffering from stress and you're suffering from like not eating properly and you're suffering from, you know, all of these things, bad relationships at home and all this stuff, all of these different things come into play and in how your business is operating. Yeah. How can you make good decisions even with your business? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, Pete, have you ever coached and worked with somebody and the conclusion was they shouldn't stay in their own business and they should go get a job and not be an entrepreneur anymore? I just did. You did. Yeah. 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 Which uh, just, is like, I mean, it's not gonna work, I, huh? I, I don't um, tip. Uh, usually most of my clients, um, they're in a position where they're actually doing fairly well. And what they want really is they want their life back. You know, that's they want to start actually living and not just pounding through the management, which is why we say from operator owner. Right. right. And uh, and so a lot of the people I work with are sort of in that zone. This one particular person um, that I worked with, um, you know, his, his business just wasn't going to fly at the end of the day. He was sort of in the position that it was um, it was sort of a la let's call it a last stop to see if things were uh, if we could make some changes and stuff like that. But ultimately, you know, after working with the person, understanding their business a little bit, um, he came to the conclusion that it was it was time to and and these are the strategic things that we need to think about right um i i've closed businesses in the past i've opened businesses i've sold businesses and you know these are big decisions along the way and the problem is is that if you don't have anybody to talk to who do you talk to about stuff like that right like typically your partner at home your wife your husband your partner whatever the case is doesn't want to hear about it anymore your friends if they aren't business owners probably don't know what the heck you're talking about. Right. And, and your team at work don't necessarily want to tell you their true opinion all the time, even though you have an open door policy um, because you're paying them. And they there's there's ultimately there's some sort of repercussion potentially if you don't like what they say that they feel that their job may be in jeopardy. So they're not always fully open. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So as, as much as we, most entrepreneurs want to have an open sort of relationship and feel, you know, when you do trust your team that they're going to tell you stuff and everything, they, they're not always fully open with that. So who do you talk to? Right. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Look, that's why I'm also a big advocate of having an advisory board, having, you know, mentors, people that are in your business who understand you can give advice to, they can give advice to you. That tab is our sponsor, you know, the advisor, the alternative board. And Mm -hmm. that's what it is. It's a, you know, it's about having those people in your business Yeah. um, because you can only serve so much of a role as their coach, uh, which kind of becomes partially their therapist, I'm sure. To Um, a certain degree. Yeah. Yeah, and people should because you got to get somebody who has your own perspective, who deals with your own their own problems. A lot of people they mean well in your life, your friends, your family, but a lot of times they're at a protection for you and cautiousness in their own life. They reflect that back to you about things you shouldn't be doing, or I wouldn't do that, or why are you doing that, you know, type of a thing. And that yeah, they end up not in intentionally, but they give you <laughs> bad advice because they're just trying to protect you, maybe psychologically, maybe subconsciously. But they're doing it, you know. Yeah, sometimes they just want to tell you what they think you want to hear. Right. That's common, too. Right. Because mm-hmm. they yeah. don't and they don't really understand what you're going through. So you got to be careful. Well, Pete, I thank you very much um, for sharing your ideas. If people want to connect with you, um, what's the best way for them to, to do that? Um, we'll put in the show notes, but let people know how to how to reach you. Yeah, sure. So simplifyingentrepreneurship.com. My business is called Simplifying Entrepreneurship. Uh, If you want to talk to me directly about how I can help you, just go to speaktopete.com. That's speaktopete.com and book in a quick chat with me. And and I can tell you a little bit more about um, our policy or all the different things that we do and and whether or not we have the right program that fits with you. And, you know, the the beautiful thing here is that... um, I really don't need to uh, do the, this kind of work, Mitch. I do it yeah. because I love it, right? Yeah. And absolutely. and uh, I really only and I've told people that I don't think you're the right fit for me as far as coaching or any of the programs that we have. And absolutely. you know maybe you should try this person or that person. And along the way, because I want I want the business owners to find the right person that's right for them, so that they can get through their problems, turn their frustrations into freedoms, move from operator to owner. Right. And, uh, you know, that's that's sort of my my gift to you is that if, if I'm not the right one, uh, then I will do everything I can to find you the right one so that yeah, it's going to move, move right you ahead. Head, you know? Yeah, I tell for people, sure. A little bit of a lawyer. I tell people that, well, you know, yeah. first thing we should figure out is if you want to work with me, if I want to work with you, if we're a good yeah. fit, if we see eye to eye, because you're going to have to rely on you and, you know, trust you and yeah. you know, all this type of stuff. So it's definitely difficult. Well, I appreciate coming on. Uh, stay on the line after the closing credits. We'll see if we can get the video back on and we can, we can wrap things up. Um, All right, man. And let's uh, stay in touch and keep changing the world and helping the entrepreneurs. Sounds great. Make it a great day, Mitch. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Accidental Entrepreneur. Opening and closing music written and performed by Howie Moscovich and Made to Order Music. For information about Howie and his music services, please follow the link in our show notes. If you like the podcast, please tell others about us. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, on Amazon Music, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and most of the other podcast directories. If you like what you hear, please leave us a five-star review and feel free to share our episodes on social media. If you have any questions or comments, ideas for the show, or you'd even like to appear as a guest, reach out to us by email at info at com. The Accidental Entrepreneur is hosted by Mitch Beinacker and produced by Beinacker Law. If you'd like to learn more about our business and legal services, you can find us on social media or visit our website at BeinackerLaw.com. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe to our feed to be notified of all future episodes.